Hello, my name is Stan Ferry. Where and when were you born? I was born in November 1923 in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk in the United Kingdom. So how old are you right now? I am coming up towards 95 years old. With a bit of luck, if I last that long, I shall be 95 in November this year, on November the 8th. Do you feel like you're almost 95? Oh, sometimes I feel like I'm 105, but yes, uh, days come and go. Uh, I have good days and I have poor days. Physically, what is it like to be 94? Uh, one misses the physical activity that uh, one used to enjoy, like tilling the garden, walking the land, shooting, uh, and one has to adopt um, sedentary uh, hobbies which with, one can cope with from uh, sitting in a chair and uh, that's the great uh, impediment of uh, old age. What branch of the service were you in during World War II? I was in the army. I joined up in 1941 at the age of 17 as a trainee tank soldier and I was in a regiment called the 58th Training and Instrument Royal Armoured Corps Young Soldiers. I did my training as a tank soldier and for some reason or other was considered suitable to be uh, sent to military college at Sandhurst for further tank training, tank training and possibly commissioning. Uh, I did my training at Sandhurst and was uh, commissioned into the Royal Armoured Corps, which was the tank a core of the British Army. But when it came to your combat experiences, what units were you in? Uh, I first uh, was posted, or to be posted, to the Suffolk Regiment Tank Battalion, which was then going into Italy. But uh, the depot I was in, the uh, adjutant uh, sent for me and said that uh, they were not going to post me to uh, my regiment overseas. Uh, they wanted to keep me in the depot as the depot sports officer. I played rugby for the army in those days and did some quarter miling, 400 metre running, uh, quite successfully. Uh, I told him that I had no wish to be a desk driver. I wished to be a, a fighting soldier. And uh, he said, uh, unlucky you, you are to be our sports officer. Uh, I uh, was not happy. I had a friend who then was serving in the desert with the Long Range Desert Group and subsequently joined the uh, Special Air Service which had been formed by David Sterling and uh, we got a communication going and he said, tell him to stuff the job, uh, come and join us. Uh, 
I wasn't sure of whether the SAS wanted to be or not, and I was flown to Alexandria, where I met David Sterling, who was the colonel of the SAS, just shortly before he was taken a prisoner of war. I came back to the UK and waited quite a long time to hear any more and eventually I was told that I'd been accepted for the SAS and that I was to establish a small unit in a, a Scottish small town called Darvel. I never went out to the desert, which is what I'd hoped to do, uh, but did a, a deal of training and uh, I did a living on the land course for three months in the northwest of Scotland and uh, small arms training at a place called Arisaig in Scotland. And I did some connecting work with the Special Operations Executive and a couple of operational parachute jumps with them taking a small SAS uh, unit as uh, protection and ultimately being brought back to the UK. Uh, I'm unhappy about my length of spell, my spell with the SAS, which ended uh, unhappily with a fracas with the uh, then acting adjutant and Paddy Blair Main, who had come back from the desert and taken over the first SAS, uh, gave me two choices. Uh, one was a court-martial for having uh, manhandled <laughs> my superior officer. Uh, the other was to find another regiment. Um, the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry then were gearing up and had been equipped to be uh, uh, waterborne, uh, known as duplex drive, DD, uh, floating tanks ready for the invasion of Europe. Ultimately, that took place on the 6th of June. Uh, uh, but I'd been summoned to the War Office to uh, give my debriefing on my time with the SAS. And so I did not actually join with the Sherwood Rangers until what is known as D plus four, June the 8th, 1944. Uh, they were then on the outskirts of uh, Bayeux, which ultimately the uh, Sherwood Rangers liberated from the German army. Uh, being a new boy to the regiment, I was not allowed to join the uh, attack there. I was a reserve in reserve. But, uh, ultimately, um, went into uh, a number of uh, tank actions with the Sherwood Rangers Germanry uh, across Normandy. Uh, Orne sur Odon, Tilly sur Seul, Comont, Cahan, Vir, Jouk, and ultimately uh, Condé sur Noiro. Uh, Condé sur Noiro was probably my biggest battle and the one that I certainly recall in very clear, very clear detail. I uh, had been fighting our way through towards Condis and Noaro and we were camped, lagged up about uh, 
a mile or so from the River Nuaro, uh, and uh, we had several days fighting. Uh, got back uh, long days then in August 1944. Dawn was four or between four o'clock and five o'clock in the morning. Dusk was between nine o'clock and ten o'clock at night. So they were very long days and we had lagered up at ten o'clock or thereabouts. And by the time we refueled the tank and replenished it with armament and cooked a meal, we eventually went to our beds at 11 o'clock or so. Uh, and uh, I'd been sleeping for half an hour or an hour when I had a shake of the shoulder uh, and a runner said, Colonel wants you. I'm a bit worried about that. I'm being summoned to the presence of the Colonel. I went to uh, regimental headquarters and he said, uh, I want you to do me a favour. Uh, I know your former background, so I think you should be quite good at this. I need to have a... Uh, reconnaissance of the river Nuaro to see whether it is passable by tanks. The land between here and there is uh, probably German occupied, but I would like somebody to go and have a look. Uh, so we did uh, an on foot reconnaissance down to the Nuaro, which was quite fun. Uh, there were one or two um, anti-personnel mines set in between, but we were able to dismantle them. We passed the German machine gun post um, and uh, bypassed that because we didn't want to alert them to our presence. Looked at the river and decided that although it had steepish banks and was a bit sandy, it was fordable. I uh, went back and on the way um, gave the uh, machine, German machine gun post that we'd uh, seen a, a, a few hand grenades, hand grenades to share between them. <laughs> so we destroyed the machine gun post fairly effectively. Reported back to my colonel uh, that the river was passable, um, went to my bed and at about an hour later got a shake on the shoulder with a runner from my squadron commander who said, uh, you've reconnoitred the river so you will be the lead tank troop tomorrow uh, crossing the River Nuaro. Uh, so we inspanned and having had uh, an hour or so sleep set forth for the River Nuaro. The first thing we came to was a large open field on which our Royal Engineers sappers were busy mine sweeping. Uh, in fact, we passed the dead body of uh, uh, our sapper who'd obviously been slightly incautious in his mine sweeping. Um, the officer in charge of the engineers stopped me and said, you can't go any further. Uh, the field's mined and we're mine sweeping. You'll have to wait until we're finished. My squadron commander had sent me two or three messages saying, 
had I got to the river yet. Um, so eventually, under pressure, I said to the uh, engineer officer, I'm going ahead. Uh, you'll have to withdraw your men. We'll risk our tanks going across the field. And I said to my, the other two tanks in my troop, follow in my tracks, sit carefully in my tracks. If I blow up, at least you'll be okay. Uh, as it was, we simply crossed and had no problems. We came to the river. Contrary to my colonel's belief in his diaries, there was a bridge, but the bridge had been blown and hadn't been repaired. So we waded the river and began to climb the hill. My squadron commander had said what he wanted me to do was to get my tanks to the top of the hill, take up a defensive hold position, and he would give me further orders. So we headed to go up the hill, and we'd not gone far when I heard a big bang on the top of my tank, past my right ear, and uh, it was an anti-tank uh, rocket from a handheld German anti-tank weapon uh, and my wireless op said to me I've lost my radio the anti-tank weapon had swept away my radio aerial and despite his best attempts my uh, wireless op couldn't get my radio operational the country we were in was not country for tanks. It was anything from eight to 10 feet high in what was known as bocage, which was French shrubs and trees. And I couldn't see my other two tanks. I couldn't make any signals, couldn't talk to anybody because I had no radio decided the best thing to do was to head on up the hill and hope my other two tanks would be following. I discovered subsequently that my corporal had been badly wounded and my sergeant had been killed in going to his assistance. But I only discovered that much later on. Uh, I didn't know quite. I thought the best thing to do was to head on up the hill. Uh, and uh, see what happened. There was another big bang on my lap gunner, who sat in the front of the tank, said, Good! It's torn me trousers. And uh, another anti-tank, uh, Missile had carved a small hole in the hull of my tank and the blast had blown through into the lap gunner's area and ripped his trousers and scratched his legs. Uh, but we carried on driving and I decided there was a deal of sniping going on a lot, of, a lot of mortar bombs and some anti-tank weapons about, I dis decided to close the lids of my tank. I reached up to close my tank lid and had a nasty, stinging, burning sensation in my left arm, which dropped onto my side, and I said, God, I've been stung by a bloody bee. 
then I wiped my arm and there was a lot of blood and I couldn't lift my arm. Uh, and I hadn't been stung by a bee. I'd been hit by a sniper. My, uh, my wireless operator fitted my arm up with a splint and strapped my arm and uh, we decided to carry, I decided to carry on up the hill uh, and we went on a bit further and uh, there was another big bang and my driver said, I've lost my steering, sir. He said, I, I'm all right with my right hand track, but my left hand track has jammed. Skipped down to have a look and discovered that uh, an anti-tank weapon had sprung the driving sprocket on my near side track. And although we could steer to the left, we could go round in a circle. Uh, we couldn't steer to the right because uh, when you put the brakes on the right-hand track, the left-hand track wasn't uh, driving. Uh, at that point, I decided that I needed to pull out of the action and somehow or other, my driver manipulated my tank round and we drove off back down the hill and returned to squadron headquarters. There I was sent to uh, a military aid post who took one look at my arm and said, Christ, the bone's all splintered. Um, the bullet may still be in there, but I think it's come out. Um, you're going back to England for a hospital. So I was sent back to the UK and uh, went into hospital in the UK. Uh, I was a walking wounded by then uh, and my arm was patched up with uh, the predecessor to penicillin uh, which was known as uh, a Mayan Baker uh, med medicament and uh, my my arm patched up they took the splinters out and um, the bone grew back uh, I was a mad keen rugby player at the time and actually played for a local rugby club uh, with my arm in, in a splint, uh, having made friends with the night nurse who uh, very kindly had a mixture of plaster of Paris made up so that when I got back to the hospital from playing rugby, she was able to paint out the grass on my on my uh, splint and uh, uh, eventually I was able to have leave from the hospital uh, and take a night out I went to Manchester with a friend from the hospital ward and uh, in Manchester, we bumped into two young ladies uh, whom we picked up and I invited them to come and have a drink with us. One of those was a Danish girl called Annalisa uh, and we became very attached. And in December of 1944, after I was discharged from hospital, to go back to join the Sherwood Rangers, uh, I married Annalisa. And so in December 1944, I was a married man and uh, sent back to Belgium 
to join up with the Sherwood Rangers again, uh, where I was given my troop back. And as a troop commander, uh, broke out of Holland and drove on into Germany and uh, approaching a town called Heinsberg. Um, I had my tanks lagered up, ready to go into uh, an assault on the town of Heinsberg. And we were heavily mortar bombed with uh, a, a particular weapon called a Nebelwerfer, which was a five-barreled five German mortar. Um, I heard three whizzes and three bangs and thought, God, they're getting a bit close. I was out of my tank at the time, having been to see my squadron commander, and I was on my way back. Uh, but uh, the bombs were a bit close, so I dived for cover. But I was just too late and got hit by a great deal of shrapnel in my left chest, my left arm, right leg, my face, and taken to hospital. Uh, I was first of all into an American military hospital close by, and uh, I was unconscious when I went in. But when I woke up in the morning, there was lying on the cabinet beside the bed a purple heart, oh, which I thought was rather nice. Uh, uh, an American soldier came along with a clipboard and said, uh, what's your name and unit, soldier? And I said, uh, Captain Stanley Perry, Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. Who the hell are the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry? And I said, uh, well, you must know them. They are the best British tank regiment, the best tank regiment in the British Army. Oh, he said, you're a limey. You can't have that and took my purple heart away. <laughs> Which... Uh, let me be reft. Uh, I was moved from the American hospital and eventually flown back to the UK where I went to a chest hospital and had shrapnel removed from my chest. The surgeon who removed the shrapnel said that he had found a small piece of shrapnel on the wall of my heart, another fraction of an inch, and I would have been dead. Uh, subsequently, discovered that the leather folder photograph, which my new wife had given me for my 21st birthday, had been pierced by this piece of shrapnel before it entered my chest. And quite certainly, if the shrapnel had not been decelerated by my wife's photograph, I should have been dead. <laughs> um, I was promoted captain and uh, when I came from hospital some Eight or nine months later, I was given the adjutancy of a German prisoner of war camp in a uh, the park of a stately home just outside Kettering in Northamptonshire. I had three thousand German prisoners 
virtually under command and uh, spent a couple of years still in the army looking after a looking after a uh, looking after a german prisoner of war camp uh, where uh, i made friends with some germans and quite recently have had uh, a, a great deal of pleasure having met uh, Carey Drayton, a uh, archivist, sorry, uh, an archivist uh, in Northamptonshire, an American archivist in Northamptonshire, uh, and Carey introduced me to the Duke of Buccleuch, who owned the park in which I'd run the camp. And one thing led to another, and the Duke invited me to have lunch, and ultimately to be the central figure in uh, a presentation that they made for the opening of uh, his stately house, Barton House, uh, which was open one month a year in August. All my small artefacts that I have from the war are still actually at Barton House, and they're bringing them back in uh, 10 days' time. Uh, but that was, that was really quite an exciting and uh, elevating experience for me. I left, I left the army in the summer of 1947 and uh, not being able to find employment that suited me in the UK, went to live in Denmark for three years and sadly the worst of that was that I lost touch with uh, many of my old army friends uh, in the UK here. I came back to the UK in 1950 and went to work for Unilever, for whom I worked for 35 years, until I retired. I, that was amazing. Thank you for going through your history. I do have que specific questions for yes, you. Yes, surely. That's okay. Surely, I would. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay, sir. So, I just want to backtrack a little bit. What specific unit were you in when you were in the Special Air Service? I was in the Special Air Service, but I was seconded to uh, look after a small unit which didn't actually have a name. <laughs> the SAS normally divided into small groups of uh, an officer and three men. And uh, occasionally came together as a regiment to, to fight more or less as a parachute infantry regiment, but frequently the small groups were used for penetration of behind the lines, um, uh, behind the German lines in both the desert before my time and in Northwest Europe to join up with um, local uh, resistance resistance groups. Thank you. Yes, to join up with local resistance groups and uh, help to get arms uh, posted to them to provide a little protection sometimes for members of the special operations executive who effectively were spies and leaders of resistance groups. Uh, so they had a very mixed 
of the SAS had a very mixed role. And when you were in the SAS, my understanding is that there were different, like there was SAS group number one, SAS group number five. Were you, do you remember what group you were a part of? Um, I, uh, technically, I was attached to the first SAS, which uh, was David Sterling's uh, regiment originally. But when David Sterling was captured, uh, was taken over by Colonel Paddy Blair Main, uh, and uh, he became the uh, regimental CO. Ultimately, uh, he was still in the desert when I first joined them, uh, and I didn't meet up with him until perhaps early, perhaps the middle of 1943, or perhaps even a bit later, August 1943, I think he came back to the UK, and technically I was, I reported to uh, Paddy Blair Main. Can you take me through the specialised training that you received uh, to be an effective SAS member? Uh, yeah, uh, some of it at least. Uh, my first, uh, first training was uh, as a parachutist. Being a tank soldier, I had never been in a parachute. Um, I uh, was sent to the first parachute training centre, which was uh, in a place called Ringway, which is now uh, Manchester Airport. And that was the first parachute training centre. And to qualify for payment as a parachutist, one had to complete 12 parachute jumps, which I did. Uh, and I think I received two shillings a day extra pay. My first jump was from a balloon, uh, a barrage balloon with a basket hung underneath it, uh, which was tethered to a lorry. Uh, by a cable and was let up about 350 feet, paid out. And uh, the lorry then drove off to create an angle with the uh, tethering rope so that parachutes could safely descend without impacting the, the tethering rope. Uh, there were a small group of us, four, in the basket and the routine was that uh, one had a dispatcher who uh, said, action stations, and on action stations one swung one's feet out of a hole in the bottom of the basket and uh, then ultimately the uh, dispatcher would say, go, and one would push oneself off. One's parachute was tethered to the basket by a static line and pulled out of its container, hopefully developed, and one descended safely. Uh, I was in the basket with uh, three other people other ranks, and I was a junior officer then, and the dispatcher said, you'll go last, sir. Right. When it came to my turn, he said, uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, when you feel inclined, if you would please jump through that hole, I should be very grateful. Uh, I said, well, what about the dispatching process? Oh, he said I couldn't do that for an officer, sir. So I had to dispatch myself for my first parachute jump, which was quite fun. I became, sorry, I became uh, besotted with parachuting and actually 
accomplished something like 44 parachute jumps by uh, going up every time I saw anybody going out for a training jump. I used to go and say, have you got room for another one? <laughs> and uh, get a free parachute jump. I thoroughly enjoyed the parachuting. That was the great part of my life. But uh, I completed the um, completed the parachute training. I was then uh, dispatched to northwest of Scotland to live on the land, and there. Meaning I, what? I was given a rucksack with uh, sixty pounds of. A Noble 808, which is a semi-plastic explosive, and a deal of, uh, of a fuse cord. And uh, I was told that I was to have no money and no rations, and I was to live as best I could on land. Um, I was given some small cards which said your property named Overleaf has been requisitioned by uh, the uh, Defence Ministry and compensation will be paid on production of this card and so I lived partly by stealing chickens out of uh, local crofters and uh, leaving them a little card so they could claim compensation for it. Uh, I also shot a deer, uh, snared rabbits, I harvested primrose and nettle leaves for vegetables and lived for a couple of months in northwest Scotland meeting every night a uh, controller to whom I was only allowed to speak French and he uh, gave me my orders for the next day which would be that I was to go to a particular map reference and discharge a uh, charge of Noble 808 explosive as if I was demolishing some uh, uh, enemy uh, uh, establishment. Um, I found them very handy in the Scottish uh, locks uh, to throw a lump of 808 into the water and when it exploded it killed a number of fish and I was able to fish out some trout, which added to my diet of uh, rabbit and deer and uh, wild vegetables. Uh, that was quite fun, Boy Scout life. I was then sent to a little island called Arisag, which is just off the northwest Scottish coast. Um, where I was trained to use small arms, in particular uh, pistols, um, eventually being allowed to choose my own. I used a uh, 0.45 automatic for my favourite weapon, and uh, so I was trained in the use of um, small arms. Uh, pistols, Sten guns, Bren guns, uh, so uh, a considerable amount of um, armoured training. Uh, returning to uh, Darvel or nearby, uh, one or two night operations um, lasting two or three days when uh, we roved around the country and uh, uh, were 
followed by judges who uh, decided whether we'd um, successfully evaded capture or whether we'd been captured. If we were captured, we were sent back to camp and if we weren't, uh, we carried on with the exercise. Was all of this in order to qualify for the SAS or had you, were you already in the SAS? Uh, already in the SAS. One was already a member. One of uh, the only qualification the SA was SAS was physical fitness, and since I played rugby for the army, I think uh, everybody thought I must be pretty fit. Uh, so I I didn't have to pass any tests. Or what about your interview with Colonel Sterling? What did he ask you about? Virtually nothing. My name and background. Uh, I only saw him for two or three minutes. Um, very, very brief. Patted me on the head and went away. I, uh, we exchanged very few words, actually. But why would they fly you all the way to Alexandria? Uh, I found that quite remarkable. Uh, something I didn't really understand. Um, I thought it would be a long interview, but it was not. So, anyways, you, you get this training in order to become an effective member of the SAS, and what happened to you? What was... What eventually were you trained to do, and where did you have to go? Well, I was trained to parachute into occupied France and to provide some military cover for special operations executive landings. Well, the uh, special operations executive were unarmed, of course, and uh, it was expected when they landed, if they were attacked, if... Uh, their cover had been breached in any way and they were attacked by uh, German occupant forces that we were there at least to provide some little cover for their landing. And after they landed, what were you supposed to do? Uh, make our way back to the coast where we were picked up by boat and ferried back to the UK. How long were you in occupied France? Uh, about uh, 10 days the first time and two days the second time. Two days was quite disastrous. Uh, all our cover had been blown and we were lucky to escape. I had fits of conscience um, before I actually became a soldier. I spent a long time with a friend discussing the um, the moral of war and actively becoming a soldier. What do you mean? You didn't want to serve? Um, not that I didn't want to serve but I wanted to be sure that there was a cogent moral reason for going to war and killing a fellow man. Uh, and eventually, at the age of 17, would you believe, I became convinced that because of the enormous evil of Nazism, and National Socialism as practiced by Hitler and the Germans at the time, Czechoslovakia had been overtaken, Belgium, the Netherlands, France occupied. Poland. Poland, yes. Um, and all those things built up to an enormous spreading evil and 
Um, I'm, I'm surprised as I look back at the age of 16 or so how very careful I and my friend, who happened to be the vicar's son, <laughs> I was brought up as a practising Christian, mm -hmm. um, we were very concerned about the morals of war and eventually concluded that um, the only way of preventing the further spread of Nazism, the invasion of our own land and becoming subjugated by the Germans, we eventually came to the conclusion that uh, that was an evil which could only be prevented by waging war. And that was when we decided to uh, join the army. A, a war is a war is 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 awful in that um, one has to make decisions. Uh, particularly if you're in a position of uh, any sort of authority, whether you're a large corporal or a, a general officer, commanding in chief, you have to make decisions about. A, the people that you're fighting with and killing them, maiming them, knowing full well that they're perhaps quite similar to you with family and friends and people at home who love them. But you, you had to make decisions about that. You had to make decisions about taking, leading, or sending your comrades, the men who were responsible to you, into positions where they could be killed or maimed. Um, and you had to make those decisions with very often very little intelligence or information or inadequate intelligence information. And uh, if you got half of them right, you were probably doing rather well. Um, on occasions, you would make the wrong judgment. And so you're not only uh, impressed with the fact that you were killing fellow men across the way, Germans, so they may be, but you were also putting lives of your comrades at risk. And if your judgment was wrong, or your decision for action or inaction was wrong, then you exposed them to death or maiming. And uh, that was always on one's conscience and on one's mind. And I suppose as a, as a young officer, my, my first concern was for the safety of my chaps. Yeah, so that they could come home. Uh, my comrades. Um, particularly in tank life. In the SAS also, when there were only a little group of four of you, you very often slept under the same blanket. But they all survived the war, right? The four men you were in the SAS with? Um, I know that at least two of them were killed. With you? Not with me, no. Later operations? Later operations. But then, as I say, having gone to Denmark and uh, lost touch with what was going on. I don't know what happened to the rest. Before we get back uh, talking about your tank, out, you know, your story with the Sh Sherwood yeah. Rangers, or not, the, the, the Sherwood Yeomen. Um, Sherwood Rangers, right. Yes. Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. Thank you. The Nottinghamshire Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. <laughs> the full title. After your SAS career, what unit did you join? 
the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. Can you explain the wording in that unit? What does each word mean? The total, the full title of the regiment is the Nottinghamshire Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. They were the Nottinghamshire Yeomanry and the Sherwood Rangers were the after followers of Robin Hood and the regiment adopted uh, Sherwood Rangers as being a diminutive uh, title for the regiment and later they formally became known as Nottinghamshire Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. And explain to me uh, what division were you guys a part of? The regiment were a part of the 8th Armoured Brigade. The 8th Armoured Brigade was three regiments of tanks, armoured vehicles, um, and part of the uh, army that invaded, uh, that first of all fought in the desert, came back to this country and then were part of the invasion. The Sherwood Rangers were equipped with uh, what were known as duplex drive tanks, DD tanks, uh, which were amphibious, or meant to be amphibious, and were to swim into the French coast uh, on D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. The 8th Armoured Brigade was an independent brigade and used uh, to support infantry and other attacks uh, according to the Commander-in-Chief's wishes. So quite often the regiment was divided up into uh, individual squadrons and so ordinary just individual squadrons might be fighting separate battles. How many tanks would be in a squadron? Uh, there would be, uh, in a squadron would be four troops, each troop consisting of three tanks, except a little later in the uh, war uh, when a fourth tank was introduced. Uh, the um, Sherwood Rangers were equipped with uh, Sherman tanks, uh, the Sherman, the ordinary Sherman tank had a 75 millimeter gun. Uh, later was produced a version which had a 17 pounder gun, uh, nicknamed the Firefly, and uh, they were normally attached to an already existing troop of three. 75 millimeter gun tanks. My my specific personal role was that I commanded a troop of three tanks, sometimes four, but normally uh, one of three tanks. That troop would be one of four troops, which would comprise a squadron and the squadron of three squadrons would comprise the regiment. So it's a small regiment? Uh, because of our particular independent role, we did operate independently. Normally, an armoured regiment would um, deploy two of its three squadrons and have one in reserve quite frequently because the 8th Armoured Brigade was an independent brigade and used for support. Uh, tank troops were separated off 
to operate independently. My regiment was Sherman, so uh, a full crew would be five. Okay, and can you tell me the roles in the tank, please? Uh, yes, in uh, there would be the tank commander, a gunner, a wireless operator, a driver, and a co-driver who would also be termed a lap gunner because he would sit in a seat next to the driver but have a machine gun at his disposal. Did your tanks, did the tank commander have a machine gun? Uh, he could have. There was a fitting on the top, but um, uh, they were more trouble than they were worth. And, and tell me about the terrain that you first experienced in Normandy and the difficulty of fighting in that terrain, please. Um, the, some of the early terrain was not too bad because it was agricultural uh, with hedges and open spaces. But how, wasn't it but, difficult to get through the hedgerows? But uh, I, quite often banks and uh, difficulty of climbing through hedgerows, yes. Uh, roads were very narrow and quite often one would drive down a road and the track tanks, uh, the tank tracks would be actually on the banks of the road and not on the road itself. Uh, so narrow roads were not helpful. Um, cross country initially was not too bad, as I say, a deal of agricultural. Uh, further into, uh, and I'm speaking of the Northwest European Normandy campaign at the moment, further into the country, uh, there was a great deal of uh, what wooded, semi-wooded um, country, which was called Bocage, um, lots of shrubs, large bushes, small trees, which impeded the progress on the tank and particularly uh, impeded the visibility from the tank of um, foot soldiers carrying anti-tank weapons in particular and of course providing good cover for larger anti-tank weapons I think particularly of the German 88 millimeter and uh, other opposing tanks. You had mentioned um well, I guess I wanted to know, did you stay with the same crew throughout the war? Uh, no, um, my, my crew changed from time to time, either because of wounds, mostly because of wounds, uh, or a couple of occasions because um, after Christmas 1944, people with... Um, more than six months overseas service and less than six months and less than six months uh, at home in the UK were allowed to take leave. So one had to change uh, for some of the older soldiers, one had to have a replacement. Um, can you please tell me, sir, the name of your tank? Um, I personally chose the name and I called it Caligula. What does that mean? Uh, well, Caligula was uh, rather nasty, um, pervert, Roman pervert, um, I'm afraid, but he particularly, um, murdered his own family to, uh, sorry, particularly murdered his own family to um, achieve uh, the Caesarship. Uh, but um, 
I was told that I should name my tank beginning with a C because I was in the C squadron of uh, the regiment and that for preference it should be classical. And the only classical name I could think of beginning with a C was Caligula. Was your tank ever knocked out? I lost uh, three tanks altogether. And from your squadron or that you no, were in? No, my, my personal tank. Um, the first time I got hit by an anti-tank uh, gun and it made rather a mess of all our um, tr tracks and um, had to go back to be replaced and so I had a replacement tank for that. Uh, uh, twice I also got uh, knocked out by on one occasion, uh, uh, my turret was jammed by being hit on the turret ring by an anti-tank weapon. On then the other occasion, again, uh, I, I was hit in the uh, in the tracks and had to hand over my tank to be replaced. Uh, and the fourth occasion, I got an anti-tank shell in my back end, in my engine, and my tank uh, in our parlance brewed up, caught fire. And uh, luckily I was able to um, abandon tank with all my crew with only my radio operator suffering some burns to his legs but none of them fatal. When, when you were in combat, sir, were you ever strafed by the German Luftwaffe? Uh, yes, uh, once or twice. Um, uh, we would try and take a bit of cover under whatever was available um, and hope for the best. There was no way of... Um, combating that. We were on one occasion attacked by our own RAF. What happened? Uh, I personally, uh, in my troop, I had a, a Bren gun. I had a Bren gun carrier uh, attending with um, supplies of ammunition and uh, the aircraft were typhoons and they fired rockets and a rocket hit my Bren gun carrier and blew up all my ammunition but luckily none of them hit uh, my tank. Subsequent to that was introduced a um, ground-to-air radio link so that uh, RAF pilots could be advised that they were attacking a friendly target and uh, could be called off but until then there was no way of telling them. Uh, the theory was that uh, if one was attacked by friendly aircraft, um, one fired a, uh, what was known as a Veery pistol, which had uh, a, a signal light, and uh, one fired a red signal. But the RAF crews, when they saw this red light, thought, ah, oh, we've hit the target, we'll have another go. <laughs> so the, um, the signal was not effective. But uh, it was very, quite shortly afterwards that uh, ground to air contact, my squadron commander could contact RAF units in the air directly by radio.
I know that there was also, in the American tanks, they added a telephone to the outside of the tank in case the tanks started firing at their own men. Because it's so loud that if you're trying to get the attention of the mm. commander, you needed some way to... Did they ever add that to your... No, we never had that on our Shermans. The... Our communication system on the Sherman was known as the 19 set. This was a radio which was divided into three parts. Uh, the A set uh, had a range of uh, uh, 40 or 50 miles, theoretically. The B set had a range of four or five miles at the most. And the intercom set, the IC set, the, was the intercommunications for the tank commander and crew to talk together. That was simply internal to the tank. We all wore headphones, had microphones, and could talk to each other within the tank. But we never had any external... The only external um, contacts we had were if we were within four or five miles of whoever we wanted to speak to, we could use the Baker, the B set. Uh, if we were further away uh, and less than 40 or 50 miles, we could use the A set. Could you please take me through your experiences under German artillery fire? Um, I, mean, I mean, put me in your shoes. What is it like? to be the recipient of a German bombardment? Oh, one, uh, for s sensibility, one stayed in the tank. If one, uh, depending on the bombardment, um, we tried to stay in cover whenever possible. Quite often uh, uh, in lager, for example, when we were, uh, resting or out of action, we would um, go into an orchard where we had some cover overhead uh, from aircraft and uh, where we had a bit of cover from uh, German artillery. But for mortar bombs, one stayed in the tank and, uh, if sensible, closed the lids uh, because the mortar bombs were not penetrative and would only bounce off the um, bounce off the tank. Did you have armored infantry fighting with you? Did I have armored infantry fighting with you? Infantry. Um, it it was at different times. Mostly, we were supporting infantry. But, I mean, would they ever ride on your tanks? Uh, yes. Um, I, in fact, I have had a picture. I, I haven't got it at the moment. It's in Barton. Uh, I have a picture of my own tank with a number of Scottish soldiers sitting on it. And uh, occasionally we would get perhaps almost a platoon of infantry either riding on our tank or taking cover from it. Uh, so, yes, um, we didn't encourage passengers uh, because uh, we needed a free sweep for the turret and the gun to be able to fire at targets. But um, for transport between, um, between actions, uh, quite often we'd uh, carry a few... Uh, few infantrymen with us. Advancing into a battle, we would probably, as tanks, go in what we would call line abreast. Uh, that is, one tank to the left, one tank to the right, and probably the commanding tank in the centre. 
and uh, we would perhaps have infantry support who would try to guard our flanks and advance forward with us. Um, we would meet uh, various um, opposition. Um, heavy artillery bombardment was unusual if we were on the move. Um, mortar bomb uh, bombardment was significant and in particular the Germans had a, a five-barreled mortar which was called a Nebelwerfer and that fired uh, five bombs in a row and uh, they could just slightly adjust the uh, the 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 sighting of the of the mortar so that they covered the best the most attacking position um so we would be faced with mortar bombs which were more lethal to the uh, infantry than they were to the tanks uh we would face machine guns um which uh the bullets just used to bounce off the tank, but were again lethal to the infantry. Uh, in any battle where we were supporting infantry, we would see infantry being shot uh, or mortared and killed or maimed or disabled um, uh, routinely. I mean, what is that like to see when you're in a tank and you're seeing these vulnerable infantry riflemen out there, but you can't do anything about it, getting, you know... Well, we did as much as we possibly could to prevent or dissuade, uh, to prevent or dissuade the um, opposition by uh, use of uh, high-explosive shells from our tank guns, 75 millimeter shells, but using high explosive um, shells rather than armor piercing shells. Uh, we would fire our machine guns. We had uh, 0.3 Browning machine guns fitted to the tank, one in the turret and one uh, forward in the hull. And we would therefore try to set up a an attacking wall of fire which would discourage the uh, people shooting in our infantry. Um, sometimes the infantry would try to shelter behind, behind our tanks. Um, were there any specific times when you were in combat that you provided first aid to fellow wounded soldiers? Uh, personally, no. I, I was actually trained in first aid because before I joined the army, I'd been a member of what was known as the British Red Cross, which was a first aid unit in the Air Raid Protection Service, which operated across the country. That was when I was a civilian, so I did have some first aid training. I did bandage um, odd cuts and bruises, but never, uh, never gave medical aid of any great significance. Uh, my task was uh, to concentrate on the objective and to get my tank and my tank troop up to the objective and uh, there were medical aides coming behind us and picking up the wounded. Um, significant to the care we had was our padre, uh, the army chaplain uh, who was in the regiment and uh, particularly uh, a, a death for a death in a in a tank. 
our chaplain, whose name was Skinner, our chaplain would um, remove the body from the tank and care for it in a Christian way. But he would also clean up the blood in the tank for us. Not a nice job, but he would do it. And uh, that enabled us sometimes to have a tank member badly wounded and bleeding, but still be live in the tank without too much blood. Uh, so uh, one's role was not um, not not to act as a medical assistant or yeah. I mean, you were the commander. Mm. Um, what kind of targets would you guys go after? Um, I suppose they divided into three. One was simple, sorry, one would be simple dug-in infantry, machine guns, rifles, um, possibly mortars. Um, and they would be the first. The second would be the bigger uh, artillery units of uh, the naval Werfer, which tended to operate separately, tanks with anti-tank weapons, perhaps, uh, 88 millimeter guns, which the Germans used as Severe anti-tank weapons uh, were a particular um, aim to uh, disable because of their destructive uh, ability. And then, of course, German tanks, Tigers and Panthers, uh, becoming prolific later in the stages. Uh, both of which had uh, heavier armour and bigger guns than our Shermans and meant that we had to try to be uh, cleverer at the tactics and approach from the side or the rear of uh, those particular items, tigers. Panthers, 88s, tried to approach them from the side or the rear before they could align and uh, shoot at us. Uh, we, we could form an echelon, which would be uh, probably the troop commander at the front and uh, the corporal in his tank on the near side rear and the sergeant and his tank on the near side, on the offside rear, slightly not in line, so that they could protect the flank of the um, of the leading tank. Um, we could go into action like that. We could go into action line ahead, which would be. Uh, probably the troop commander leading, followed by his corporal, followed by his sergeant, and staying in the same track. Or we could go in in a straight line abreast system with all three tanks in a straight line going forward together. So there were variations in the uh, position and sometimes particularly in echelon formation, where the two other tanks were defensive protective rather than aggressive. What do you remember um, about the destruction done to the different towns and cities in Germany? Um, I wouldn't wish to offend my American friends and uh, 
just, those, just, just say it. Those who had uh, um, the American style of war tended to be to lay very heavy barrages and uh, destroy lots of buildings if there was any risk whatsoever of a German occupation. We tended to have perhaps slightly different strategic or tactical approaches in which we felt that the, we shouldn't be demolishing what might be perfectly innocent French buildings and we would attempt to advance and then check whether the buildings were offensively occupied or whether they were just standing empty with the French people had uh, But the Americans off. wouldn't take that chance. The Americans tended, uh, not always, I... I, I um, but you're saying it, it, I think it was a matter of style, and yes, I think the Americans tended to go for pre uh, judging before yeah pre barrages rather than uh, 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 attack. Uh, yeah, but a chance. Um, so, so the, the towns and cities that you did see. I mean, what do you remember about the destruction? Um, I remember going through one small town called ornay sur odon I think, which had been virtually totally demolished, except for the church tower. And we were driving our tanks over a house rubble of demolished houses. Um, I rather think the Germans were responsible for the greater part of that demolition than the Allies, but I, I don't know that for certain. Yes, uh, quite often um, one or other of the tanks whether we were operating as an individual troop or with a number of troops. Um, quite often a tank would be hit and one could see one's, uh, sometimes even to brew up, uh, break into flames, right? <laughs> Use the slang. Um, one would see perhaps a, a fellow tank being blown up or burning. But again, one's concentration would be on, uh, on on the target and on the final intent rather than on what was happening to other people. What would usually cause a tank to blow up? What would usually cause a tank to blow up? What would... Cause it to blow up? What would cause it? Well, um, well particularly the German 88mm gun was very, very effective uh, and it would use armour-piercing shells which could penetrate a tank armour, land up perhaps in the um, petrol or fuel tanks or into the engine and then the fuel would ignite and that would cause the tank to uh, burst into flame and uh, set off the uh, ammunition that would be stored around the inside of the turret of the tank and cause a uh, major explosion or, um, or just a fire. Um, I've seen crews fail to get out. I've taken my own crew out when we uh, brewed up, but I... Uh, I Personally, in my own troop, I had a routine training which was abandoned tank and I would cause my troop to halt and abandon tank 
and we had a routine where my gunner would put his shoulders under my bridge and give me a shove and my wireless operator would put his shoulders in the underneath the gunner and give him a shove and we would go out in a line um, the gunner giving a hand to the uh, wireless operator so they were all hooked up in a line and we would dive over the side of the tank at risk of broken limbs or whatever but at least we would get out and on the occasion that I brewed up my my wireless op did get some burns. The gunner's role uh, in bailout was first to centre his gun, swivel the turret, and centre the gun so that it didn't impede the two hatches that were in the front of the tank, which allowed the driver and the co-driver to evacuate. Did your tank blow up after you guys got out? It didn't blow up, it just brewed up and um, ammunition was blowing off, of course, inside it. All the, uh, all the shells that would be our store of uh, ammunition and all the uh, bullets, which would be the store for machine guns, would be blowing off and banging away. But my, my tank didn't actually, in a sense, blow up in a big heap. It but just, it, it could have. There's no, it, there's no reason to take that risk. No, no. No, but if a tank burned, you had something like 20 or 30 seconds to get out before you were burned. So it had to be quick. Mr. Perry, what was the highest rank you achieved by the time you left the service? Captain. Um, you had mentioned earlier that there were times you saw tank crews fail to get out of their t tanks that had been hit. Yeah. What do you mean by that? The tank was hit, the tank brewed up, they didn't get out because they were too badly burnt, perhaps, to move and uh, were left in the tank. For example, advancing in uh, a straightforward line, you could see another tank for perhaps uh, several hundred yards away. If I saw a tank get hit and I saw smoke coming out of it and uh, possibly flame and saw uh, or heard um, ammunition exploding in the tank, it was fairly certain that the crew were caught in the tank. We were assembling to begin an offensive against a German town called Heinsberg which was quite heavily defended by the Germans. Uh, we had assembled and were what we called lagered up. That means all the tanks were uh, at rest. Um, my sergeant, Sergeant Taubman, was in his tank and um, standing with his head and shoulders out of the tank. Uh, we were mortared by a German offensive weapon um, called a Nebelwerfer, which was a mortar with five barrels and it discharged its five mortar bombs across uh, the area in which we were assembled. One of those mortar bombs landed directly on the roof of Sergeant Taubman's tank. Whether it hit Taubman or not, I couldn't say, but it 
must have been very, very close to him. Uh, it does mean that he was instantly killed and his body dropped back into the tank. Um, his tank crew, understandably, evacuated the tank. They had a dead body and a lot of blood. Um, I was so grateful to our chaplain, our padre as we called him, uh, that he went in and recovered what he could of the body, cleaned the tank. Uh, but in the meantime, my sergeant's crew went into another tank and I had to appoint a tank commander to take place of Sergeant Taubman, uh, ready for this um, attack on Heinsberg. Um, very, very shortly afterwards, we were about to move off when my squadron commander asked uh, for what he called an O-group. This was when he called the officers of the squadron together to discuss tactics or strategy. Uh, I went to my squadron commander's tank and uh, had my chat with my squadron commander. On my way back to my tank, I too was caught by uh, a bomb from uh, Naval Werfer and uh, severely injured, knocked out, I was unconscious, um, with uh, shrapnel in my chest and my head and my left arm and my right leg and was uh, eva evacuated, uh, eventually sent back to England to a chest hospital. I, uh, so far as I recall, I was diving for a, to get under another tank, to get out of the shelling. Um, it will have made a fairly substantial uh, hole in the ground, but I, I wasn't buried. I was uh, shattered with uh, shrapnel. I still have a piece. Where? In my left ear. But would you put your head up a little? Did you see that little black thing? Well, would you put your head up a little? Put your head up a little? I want you to show the camera. No, no, you, you just bend it this way. A little more. Okay, yeah, I see. Did you get it? Yep. <laughs> so that's still in your body. That's still in my body. Various surgeons and barbers have said, oh, we only need to give it a little slit and we'll take it out. And I've said, no, you won't. You will leave it alone. It is my souvenir of the war. Souvenir de la guerre. You've never wanted to take it out? No. It, it doesn't hurt you? It's never been a problem. I've had shrapnel down my chest. I had a piece of... Sh I had a piece of shrapnel in my arm. And... About... Uh, 10 or 15 years after the war, uh, I got a little suppuration in my left arm. My doctor said it was just a cyst that would go away. And having heard that from my doctor, I came home and my young daughter and I were having a little discussion and she banged me on the arm and it bled. And we wiped it with a piece of uh, tissue and out came a piece of shrapnel. <laughs> and so I've had a piece of shrapnel taken out involuntarily as well as voluntarily. What kind of person was Sergeant Talman? Uh, outgoing, uh, mature, uh, um, 
I, I'm sure he must have been well into his 30s and uh, a good thinking, decent man who had uh, family at home in England, who believed in what he was doing, who was loyal to me as his commanding officer and who related between me and the men in the troop exceedingly well. How old were you when you were in combat? I would have been, my first combat, I would have been 20. At uh, Sergeant Taubman's death, I would have been just over 21. I mean, what is that like when you're in charge of men who are quite a bit older than you? Um, that's a question better ask of the men than me, but I believe our relationship was good. I believed in listening to my men and talking to them and trying to explain the reasons for what we did. Uh, whether I was very articulate or good at it, I do not know. Did you ever feel but, doubt, self-doubt, being so young? Yes, uh, quite often worried about um, age. I was enormously um, buoyed up. My gunner, my tank gunner, who'd been with me for some time, uh, came back to the UK on leave. And I had bought a, a bottle of Chanel Number no. 5 perfume in Ostend at a fairly cheap price. And I was sending it back to my wife. And he brought it back to the UK and he posted it to my wife in the UK. But he posted a letter with it in which he said that it had been an enormous honour to serve with me, that I had always been an honest and straightforward officer, that I had been no coward, but that I had never ever taken what seemed to be an unjustified risk. And that gave me enormous strength and uh, belief that, I'd, that my relationship with my men was the right one. I infinitely preferred travelling with my head and shoulders up because I could get a better view um, and I could direct my guns and uh, my troop better from uh, a better vision but I could fold my tank lids down and I had a periscope and I could see through a periscope but the vision was very limited. The one thing I always did when I closed my tank lids was to close them the wrong way so that they overlapped and there was just a small gap left. Um, so you could see? Not, I could see a little bit, but the major thought was that if I had them fully closed and the mortar bomb landed on top, it could virtually seal them and there would be no way out of the tank. You didn't have any trap doors or anything? No, there were no trap doors, so there was no way out. The Sherman tanks that we had had a single hatch in the turret and that was the way out. And uh, so I, I always, um, I always, as I say, closed my tank, my hatch doors the wrong way so that they overlapped a bit. Only left about uh, a one inch gap, but... Uh, 
at least. They wouldn't cease to gallop. Besides the time that you were hit by the sniper, did you have any other experiences under sniper fire? Oh yes, it was, it was not infrequent that um, uh, there were quite a lot of uh, poplars, Lombardy poplars. What? T Lombardy poplars, tall straight trees which uh, formed uh, perfect cover for a sniper to climb up and perch in the branches and have a, a long view. So it was not unusual to have uh, snipers. Um, some were better than others. In America, uh, the, gun, the tankers would carry personal weapons like a grease gun, like a Thompson submachine gun? Yeah. Did you guys carry any automatic weapons? Yeah, we had uh, what was known as a Sten gun. It was almost a lethal weapon. If you dropped it, it went off. <laughs> and uh, many an injury was caused by somebody dropping their Sten gun. Uh, it was, I forget, but I think probably about, um, carried about 20 bullets or something like that. It was a semi-machine gun. Um, I did have a Tommy gun which uh, some kind American had uh, given me. What do you mean? I met some American soldiers and um, they asked me what my personal weapons carried were and I said we'd got these little Sten guns in the tank and I personally carried a forty-five automatic and... Uh, one of them said, what do you want? It's a Tommy gun. And uh, he gave me several cases of uh, Tommy gun am ammunition and a Tommy gun. Did you ever use the Tommy gun? A Thompson gun? submachine gun. <laughs> Did you ever use the Tommy gun? Uh, not, uh, not really actively, no. But it was always handy to have if I decided that I needed to dismount from the tank and have a look and see whether there were any occupied houses. Um, it was handy to have a personal weapon which was uh, more lethal than a pistol. And uh, one would come to a few houses perhaps, a few French houses. And I remember one in particular, I stopped and there was a Frenchman, and I said, are there any Germans in the houses? And he said, I think there may be some in that one. So, uh, using my old training, I took my gunner, who carried a rifle, or the Tommy gun, and I had my forty-five automatic, and I kicked the door open, saw a movement and shot and there was a big bang and a clang and a ding dong and I shot a grandfather clock. <laughs> um, but I did, I have once entered a room in which there were three German soldiers um, and uh, I told them to put their hands up and I shot the first one who put his hands up because that was my background training, strictly against Geneva Convention. But um, I was trained that if you had a group of men and you only had a pistol and you were holding them up, the first one to put his hands up, you shot because he was the one with the quick reactions that would be likely to uh, overcome you. And uh, in shooting the first one, the others would be uh, quelled. And I did do that once. 
what was the reaction of the other two Germans when you killed the guy who right yes, next to you? Hand up. Um, some of the Germans were very courageous, you see, or very adamant. And if you told a German to put his hands up, if you put them up with the uh, with clenched fists and the palms turned away, he could easily be sealing, concealing a um, grenade in one of his hands. So you always made sure that if they told them to put their hands up, that they put their hands up with their palms facing and their fingers spread. So they didn't have any armament. Who who taught you that in training that you're supposed to shoot the first guy who puts his hands up? That was part of the SAS training. But you weren't in the SAS anymore. No, but uh, old training dies. Old training lives with you. You, you. Um, some infantry came up after that. And I handed the two prisoners and their mate over to them to deal with. Do you remember where you shot him? I, I hit him somewhere probably about the shoulder. Um, probably somewhere ar around his left shoulder, but uh, uh, quick snapshots, you're not quite certain. Um, we had three, three men dressed in black cassocks. It was in Holland. They were dressed in long black cassocks and said that they were Netherlands uh, monks or trainee priests and that they were making their way away from their monastery. And my gunner, who was very quick, suddenly upped his gun and shot one of them. And I said, Christ, man, you've killed a bloody prisoner. What the hell are you doing? He said, look at his boots. And when we stripped his black cassock off, he had a German uniform and jack boots, and he was a German soldier trying to escape by pretending to be a priest. And there were three of them. What happened to the other two? Uh, the other two remained as prisoners, and uh, we handed them over to... Uh, one never kept prisoners as a tank soldier because uh, you had no way of disposing of them, and you were crew was too small to um, waste a member to guard them with, uh, with, with a rifle or armour. So uh, if you took prisoners, you handed them over very, very quickly to uh, other, other troops, uh, particularly to the infantry. Can you talk to me about your living conditions in combat? Uh, we lived in the tank. Uh, we did our own cooking. Um, we, in, uh, we rigged a canvas sheet on the side of the tank. And uh, as a crew, slept under that canvas sheet, quite often sharing a blanket between the five of us, um, which led to great camaraderie. And uh, the rest of the time we uh, tried to stretch our legs and... Uh, go our simple ways. My gunner was um, uh, a naughty boy who used to go and look for young ladies um, uh, when he could find them. <laughs> and, uh, 
Apart from that, we uh, write home, read books, uh, chat to each other. How long do you go without a shower? Uh, I've, I've been weeks without a shower. And, uh, and when you guys are in combat, would you ever brush your teeth or anything? I always had my toothbrush, and I always brush my teeth every day. And I'm pleased I did because I've still got most of them. I don't have any false teeth. And they're my own teeth that I've got. Um, but yes, I, I always carried a toothbrush. And um, if nothing else, I would use a little bit of salt to, uh, on the toothbrush if I ran out or couldn't find any toothpaste or anything to put on it. The, the one place that a tiger, tiger tank was slightly vulnerable to our armament was to hit it on the turret ring. That's where the mounted, turret is mounted on the hull. Uh, to hit it on the uh, turret ring with an armor-piercing shell. And quite often that would jam the turret, which would mean that they couldn't swivel the turret to fire at you. Um, and then you just uh, pump a few more armor-piercing shells in their direction. Um, so yes, I certainly, uh, I certainly disabled at least one tank, I and mean, I may have disabled a couple more. The tank that you definitely disabled, what happened to the crew, the German crew? Oh, uh, they were still in it after I passed them because I was on my way by, <laughs> and I I just left them. I, they will have been captured by the following infantry, or um, whether they were killed in the tank, I, I, I never knew. I got shot. I, I, I put my arm up to close my tank lid and felt a sting and uh, said to my tank crew, I've been stung by a bloody bee, but my arm had dropped and I couldn't lift it and it was all bloody. And I said, no, I haven't been stung by a bee. Some bugger shot me. Uh, and my wireless operator said, let's have a look. And he said, Christ, you've got a broken bone. And uh, he found a piece of wood and uh, some battle dressings, field dressings, and uh, wrapped them up, spread the wood on my arm and wrapped it round with, um, it was my forearm I was hitting. He, he wrapped it round with uh, bandages and gave me a sling. And so I had my arm in a sling and I said, I'm after that bloke who shot me. I suspect he's in those trees over there, a row of poplar trees. And so I commanded my gunner and my lap gunner to direct their machine guns at each, each tree in turn and blaze up and down each tree two or three times. And uh, actually quite quickly, one tree, a German soldier fell out. And uh, he was suspended by something or other, but he, he looked as if he was probably dead. He was, he was hung by some sort of harness, but it was very clear that he was the sniper. Did that feel good that you got the sniper that tried to kill you? Yes, um, but it felt better that he wasn't going to have us. Wasn't he going to get a shot in at anybody else? There was a tank commander uh, hit by a, a sniper and the likelihood it would be him 
if not, uh, I don't know where there would be, where, where there would be another snipe Was that commander killed or wounded? He was killed. Mm -hmm. um, the German and their Panzerfausts, were they, you know, those anti-tank weapons? Yes. Were they ever effective? Yes, they put my, put me out of action because it was Panzerfaust that um, took away my air radio aerial, which uh, made a hole in my hull and which eventually um, sprung my uh, driving sprocket on my near side. Uh, track. And but, but how would they be used? I mean, would, they, would the Germans just run up to the tank? They had to, um, I, I caught one group uh, and we, we shot them uh, with machine gun fire. Um, uh, they were running across our front and they had a little, little barrow, a little wheeled barrow and uh, they were running, pulling that and I think that they probably carried their anti-tank rocket gun on this little barrow. Uh, and they will have carried uh, munitions for it. They were running across my front and I, uh, I uh, ordered my uh, tank gunner to um, swivel my turret and get them as a target. And... Uh, we fired the machine guns at them and uh, shot them up with machine gun fire. How many of them were they? Were there? There were there were three that we saw. There was one pulling the pulling this little barrow, and two running beside him. Was it common for your tank gunners to fire at the German infantry? Oh yes, yes. If we were opposed by infantry who would be firing at our infantry, then uh, we would discharge our, uh, our, we would do both. We would use some um, high explosive shells from our 75 millimeter gun. Um, if they looked dug in and fairly well in place, uh, or we would machine gun them if they were on foot and totally visible. I mean, with the big cannon, there must have been times that you knocked out the armored vehicles, the German armored vehicles. Yes. Yes, we used. We had two two sorts of um, of munition for the big gun. It was the high explosive shell. H E. H E, which exploded on landing, and blew shrapnel. Uh, we also had the armor piercing shell, which didn't explode, but would force its way through um, some amount of armor, not necessarily uh, all the uh, German tanks, but uh, it would force its way through the armor. I once shot down a French steeple uh, because I was sitting on a hill and looking forward, and there was a gun barrage going over to the infantry behind me, and uh, I saw a flash of light from halfway up a church steeple, and I had a look through my binoculars, and I believed that the German um, observation post which was directing the gun barrage, was sitting up in the steeple. So I fired my guns at the steeple and dismantled, dismantled the steeple. What did it look like when the cannon hit the steeple, the shell? Uh, well, nothing happened with the first couple of shells, but the second couple of shells, the, um, the halfway up the steeple, it crumpled and fell down. And uh, I'm sure that there was an observation post in there. We were on our way up the hill from the River Nuoro, and I suddenly noticed that there was a, a dugout uh, just over to the right of my tank. 
and uh, obviously occupied by German soldiers. Uh, I didn't know what armament they had, but uh, I wasn't taking any risks. So we drove, the, I directed my driver, and we drove the tank just a couple of yards away from this dugout. And because I always carried a couple of uh, Mills grenades on my belt, I unhooked a couple of Mills grenades and threw them down into the trench, which disabled what was, as it uh, emerged, uh, a German machine gun post. Uh, I drove on and left them. They, they were all obviously fairly badly wounded, um, but I drove on and left them to the infantry to pick up when they came up behind me. And both of your grenades went in? Fun. But did both of the grenades... Both of the grenades went, on, went in and went off on the bottom of the... Um, on the bottom of their pit. How come the, they didn't run away? I think they were scared to leap out of the dugout because we were fairly adjacent and they knew we would have machine guns and if they tried to run away that they would be machine gunned and I think they felt that if they stayed in their, if they stayed in their dike, they would uh, be safe from machine gun fire, which uh, they kept their heads down under the level of the um, dugout, that they would uh, that they would be safe from machine gun fire. Uh, they didn't, of course, reckon on having couple of grenades thrown in. <laughs> what life advice do you want to give to future generations? Uh, I don't know that I am capable of giving other people advice, but I would say this. Whatever you do, be honest. Be straight. If you tell the truth, if it hurts, if it's disregarded, it doesn't matter. Your conscience will be clear. You will have been honest and straight. And I have tried through my life to live up to that, that uh, the truth is what matters and honesty and straightforwardness and openness are important in personal relationships with whomsoever they are. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're with a dustman or a duke, they are people. If you are honest and straight with them, you are much more likely to get a response that you want than if you try to be devious. I think the American phrase is, what goes around comes around. And it's very, very true that what you hold out, you eventually get back. I think perhaps that's the advice that I might try to offer. That's beautiful. What would you want to say to all of the men who were killed overseas in World War II? What would you want them to know? I don't know what... Uh, um, I think I would want them to know that we had an enormous appreciation of their sacrifice, that uh, they would always be remembered by us, that we would not forget them. Uh, we might forget their names, we might forget their ages, 
but we would never forget that behind us were decent, honest men who died for a belief that they held and we honour them for it. Were you afraid of getting killed when you were in combat? I was afraid of getting killed every year. Every time I poked my head above the parapet. Yes, um, if one wasn't afraid, one wasn't aware. Um, one didn't dwell on it. One didn't make a great thing of it. One tried not to let other people know. But decent, honest afraidness is sensible. I want to be remembered as somebody who had respect for his fellow man, who endeavoured as far as he possibly could to contribute to the good life of his fellow men. I worked in lo in as a local uh, local councillor. I've served on various um, charity committees and so on. And I believe it's important that one, uh, if one has a fairly decent life, it's important that one puts back something that one has taken out. And I hope that what I'd be remembered for is that I was decent, honest, and that people had respect for me because of that. You do believe that there's a higher being? I do. No doubt? No doubt. Why is that? Um, probably early life I was born of devout parents. Um, churchgoers, uh, devout Christians, who had the right mantra, who had the right feeling for fellow man. Um, and I was brought up uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian world with a God. I've come to believe that there is probably a, a God who is much broader than the Christian God, that um, people who set their standards by some other God may well be just as right as I am. Um, so I don't, I don't scorn other, other religions. I believe that people should be free to make their own decisions and go in their own direction as long as those directions are not evil. Uh, Nazism was evil, which is why we went to war.